everyone, my name is Lewis. Welcome back to the channel. I hope I find you all in good health. Today I'm going to be talking about some of the music I've been listening to recently. I'm going to talk about each album in turn and why I would recommend them. So to kick off, the first album is from 1969 and it's the Brazilian side of my collection. And you know I have a soft spot for that. The first artist is Elise Regina and the album's entitled Elise Regina in London. I absolutely adore this album. Um, and I have a really strong impression that uh, Miss Regina enjoyed the project of making this album, uh, judging by her performance on it. This is a really good body of work. Um, there are lush, lush orchestrations on this album and the person responsible for that is a Mr. Peter Knight. Um, I'm sure he has many credits. Um, I haven't been able to find any of them, but I I'm sure he's done work on a number of albums, judging by what he's put together on this particular album. He's done a really, really good job of complimenting Miss Regina. Um, it's littered with European and Brazilian classics on this particular album. Um, there's no fillers on this one from beginning to end. It's just every track is really, really good. Um, yeah, and each track complements uh, Miss Regina's style. Now, I will put her down as an all-rounder. And what I mean by that is she can do the subtle side of vocals quite easily but she's also a power singer at the same time and that's quite a unique combination so on this particular album there are tracks which basically um, support her particular style and give her a, an opportunity to flourish in both aspects of her vocal ability now unfortunately um, pretty much to do with the era in which these type of albums came out there's very little credits as to who else in terms of performance wise in, in with the musicians who else was responsible for the sound of this particular album so I, w I would like to give a couple of mentions out but unfortunately there is no information so that's a real shame so those who are familiar to this channel know that um, I'm I have a talent for butchering the Portuguese language and I'm going to continue that trend by telling you the following or letting you know what the following good tracks are on this particular album. The first is Se Você Penza. The second one is Giro, that's G-I-R-O. And the third, you probably will know this tune or certainly heard another rendition of it and that's Zazuera. I really do like that track. I've really got a soft spot for it. Um, overall, really good album from beginning to end. Um, I managed to pick up this album a number of years ago. Um, I heard of um, Miss Regina um, and I took a punt on this album. I, it was sight unseen, so to speak. Um, and I'm really glad I got it. Um, it's really, really good. So I'm excited for you. If you've never heard of this artist and not heard this album, you're in for an absolute treat. So that's the first one. The second one is an example of really good European jazz. It's from 1978 and it's big band jazz. And the album is called Jazz Orchestral. And it's an anthology. Again, I really do like this album. It's a double album. Um, this is a repress. Um, and it's a really good repress. The actual vinyl is super clear on this one. Um, it's a masculine, robust and dynamic album, this one. Um, it isn't the most sophisticated by way of composition. But it doesn't have to be. But does have moments of sheer beauty and there's a number of examples of piano solos on this album which are really really nice um, to give you an example of the notable musicians on this particular album I'm going to try and go for the names forgive me if it's butchered 
uh, Milan Stojanovic on sax and flute and Miliov Markovic who's also on sax um, they're really good they are the kind of heartbeat of this album and although it's a, an anthology the tracks that they appear on they really are very good on them um, I would heartily recommend this album if you've never delved into the European side of jazz then this is a really good example of it almost too good um, if, this, if you've never encountered that type of music then this is almost going to spoil you um, I'm familiar with more the Polish side of jazz but that can be a bit hit and miss whereas this is a consistently good album so um, here's my next challenge is to try and highlight to you the my preferred tracks on this album so yeah look out for this the first one is called Polensna Etida the second one is Zvadbenda Igra Kraj Vistris and the third is C Zaljubiv Edno Mom now you know that was horrible pronunciation I know it was horrible pronunciation and I'm sure there's quite a few people out there whose ears are bleeding right now do forgive me um, hopefully you'll understand that I'm just enthusiastic about the album I want people to hear it and you let you know it's not my second language it's not my third it's not my fourth but I made an attempt so <laughs> please understand that an absolute corker this one um, do listen to it on some of the streaming sites first um, but if you do see it I would say this is pretty much a no-brainer um, particularly if you've got like some interest in the European side of jazz this is a very good example of their body of work which comes out of that region so yeah my second album for today my third album is a bit on the problematic side and it's a 1972 R&B album uh, by a lady called Rita Wright, otherwise professionally known as Sarita, not not Serena or Sabrina or anything like that. Sarita. That is a lovely cover, though. Yeah, I really do like that. Um, her particular vocal style is effortless, it's creamy and it's emotionally rich but she doesn't have the dynamic range of somebody like Ellis Regina who I've shown you earlier but she's very good with her level of talent um, don't underestimate her but she just doesn't have the range of some of the female vocalists that I've introduced to you during this series this album was uh, produced and written by Stevie Wonder um, who at the time of the producing this album I believe was still married to Sarita at that time um, and that's where part of my problem kicks in with this particular album it should have been better than what it is um, Stevie was still in his golden era and if there's anybody who can put an album together um, with an overarching theme it was Mr Wonder at that particular time so I'm com completely confused as to why that wasn't done on this particular album um, there is no co cohesive theme towards this in this album as I said already it just merely comes across as a series of singles and that's really unfortunate but that's not to say it's a rubbish album because it certainly isn't because you can see it in my hand I obviously rate it to a certain extent um, now when I first saw this album in a particular record shop I saw an original copy of it and it was quite expensive and um, I'm glad I didn't buy it um, I, I, considering what's on the album and the price of what that original was I think I would have yeah I would have got over it but it was slightly too expensive whereas this is a repress and I was really happy to pay the price that I did the three tracks I believe are of merit on this album are Black Maybe 
uh, to know you is to love you and I love everything about you um, those are the three tracks on there there is no other hidden gems on here that's that's basically it and again that's where my disappointment is there could have been a couple of more tracks which should have ticked it over the edge and made it a really good album rather than a three track album so have a listen to those tracks you're you're gonna like them there's no doubts about that they are quality pieces but you know it's an eight no oh, in fact it's a nine track album um and if you're only getting three decent tracks on there then yeah it does it does take some thinking as to whether or not you're gonna purchase it so um finding this on vinyl might be an issue should be relatively easy on cd but definitely have a listen to those three tracks beforehand and decide whether or not it's the one for you but yeah overall although i like those tracks it's a d disappointing venture and this is the debut album for for sarita so yeah it's a bit yeah um i, I wish i liked it more than i do but there you go, you can't win all you can't win them all. The fourth album for today, and hence my smile on my face, um, I'm so happy to introduce this album to you if you've never heard of it before, is a 1970 release, and it's by a lady called Dorothy Ashby, and it's called the Rubiat of Dorothy Ashby, and it's a spiritual jazz album. This album is absolutely phenomenal. It's just a different level. Um, it's going to knock your socks off. Um, now, as you can see here, she is playing the traditional Japanese instrument, the koto, I believe it's called. But she's more widely known for her harp playing. So I just want you to consider that just for a moment. This is a jazz harp album. Just let that sink in just for a moment. Now, of all the notes that I've written for albums that I've showcased so far during this series, um, I've probably got the most extensive notes for this particular album. And I basically had to condense it because I just went off on tangents with it. Um, this album makes you think. There's no doubts about it. Um, it's exotic, it's mysterious, and it is challenging. Now, um, what I mean by challenging is, although it's still accessible, what I mean by challenging is, is that it basically, in terms of your preconceived ideas of what you think jazz is, this throws it all up in the air. It's all up for grabs with this particular one. Um, without doubt, this lady is a visionary. Um, and I am annoyed and perturbed that she doesn't get the respect that she should do. She's a top table composer and performer. Um, and when you listen to this album, you're going to understand why I'm saying that. She should be considered, she should be mentioned in the same breath, as far as I'm concerned, as a Coltrane and a Davis and a, a Monk and a Mingus. She should be in that category. But for whatever reason, she isn't. She isn't seen that way. And it's a real, real shame because her body of work would suggest that she should be there purely on merit. Um, this album also, it makes you think. And I've tried, I think I said that in my opening salvo in regards to this, this, this particular album. Um, and one of the things it made me think about was the infinite monkey theorem. Now, you may say, well, what are you talking about, Lewis? Quite rightfully. Now, that's a popular theorem, and if you haven't heard it, I'll briefly go over it. It basically states that if you had an infinite number of monkeys with an infinite number of typewriters, and you gave those monkeys with a typewriter an infinite amount of time, they could produce the work of William Shakespeare. Now, the reason for saying this is, I'm going to reel it back in, trust me, is, is that I feel I, on a personal level, I could be given three lifetimes and not come up with this concept. It's that good. It's that original. Um, so you're, you are in for an 
absolute treat and I am jealous if you've never heard this that you're going to be hearing it for the first time as I said it's going to blow your socks off um, and yeah it's just superb this one now um, in terms of notable performers on this album um, there are the Katz Brothers that's K-A-T-Z and they're really good but actually there is a bass player who's uncredited on this album and I don't know why that's the case but they are absolutely superb and it's a real shame that I couldn't find out who this person is because again they need to be saluted for the work they carried out on this album it's absolute it's it's, it's the highest bar that, of bass playing that I've heard this album is in the highest level of albums that I have um, is it a top 20 album in my collection? definitely is it a top 10? definitely is it a top 5? I'll have to think about that a bit more but it's definitely in the top 10 and it deserves to be the tracks that I would recommend from this album are Heaven and Hell Wax and Wayne and Drink I can't wait for you to hear this album it's but give yourself time to listen to it I think it's about 40 minutes in length you want to listen to the whole thing you really do and probably when you've heard it once you're going to want to hear it again immediately it's that good so if you see it well have a listen to it on streaming sites first um, should be easily available on CD uh, on vinyl you pretty much yeah you should be able to get it for a reasonable price if it floats your boat I would say get it as soon as possible this is one for everybody's collection particularly if you like jazz the last album for today is a 1977 offering and it's in it's in the jazz fusion section of my uh, collection and it's by a gentleman called Mr Roy Ayers and his band Ubiquity there's the album cover there and I'll flip it up just so that you can read it more easily um, Roy is something else and you may well have heard of him but this dude is super cool um, he's the premier vibesman uh, vibraphonist um, would be the correct title he's just superb um, there's very few people who can create as many uh, shoulder shuffling, toe tapping, summer dance anthems as Mr. Roy is. Um, yeah, you can see I've got a real soft spot for him. I've got a number of these albums. Um, and every one of them is going to have an absolute, at least two or three corking tracks on, here, on them. Um, he is imitated by quite a few people and um, on the basis of his work um, and his influence the acid jazz movement from the 90s certainly took quite a bit of his blueprint and sound and kind of made it their own but this is really where it started um, he's also apart from doing those kind of banging summer anthems um, He's got a delicate side as well and he's really good at seductive and sensual ballads and on this album there is a particularly good example of that um, he's really good at bass lines as well he really is um, you're just in for a treat with this so notable performers on this particular album uh, would be James Mason on guitar Philip Wu on piano and Justo Almario on sax now you might have heard those names, um, me mention those names in earlier episodes and you wouldn't be wrong because uh, James Mason, um, I highlighted his particular album, his seminal album, Rhythm of Life in an early episode, really good album. Um, so yeah, those three were part of that. Also we have D.D. Bridgewater and vocals on this particular album. Um, if you haven't heard of her, she she's a backing singer of note and she does appear on quite a few people's albums. She's really good. 
she's had her own solo career as well but she's more known as a backing singer on other albums but she's really good as well the three tracks that I would highlight from this album are the seminal uh, Running Away, Got to Find a Lover and Together. Really good tracks. Um, as album as a whole, it's a bit hit and miss, but those three tracks are well worth it. And I'm just, a, you know, I'm just keen on all of Roy's work. So I'm happy to buy his albums for three tracks. It's not a problem for me. I'd do it all day, every day. He's really that good. So that concludes today's roundup. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining me. It's been highly entertaining, certainly on my part. I, I hope that you got something out of it. And I've introduced you to some albums that you've never heard of before. If you've enjoyed the content, uh, please consider subscribing. Hit the like button. And if you've got any suggestions or comment, please do so below um it's been an absolute pleasure for me so i really do appreciate your time so look after yourself and i'll see you again in the next episode thank you <laughs>